Welcome to Russian History Retold, episode 155. Leon Trotsky, Ouster and the End. Last time, we went over the life of Leon Trotsky between the 1905 revolution and the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II in 1917. And you must be thinking of regular listeners, wow, two episodes in one week, what's giving? Well, I'm getting a little bit of Trotsky fatigue. Because when I first went into the podcast series, I had not a positive outlook on Leon Trotsky, but more of a kind of neutral one. And, you know, the fact that he was hounded by Stalin to the end of his life and murdered in 1940. And I know I'm not giving away anything here. But when I started really researching Leon Trotsky, it went from being kind of a noncommittal on him to rather negative one. And I think you're going to hear this within the entire podcast. I no longer have any positive a viewpoint of Leon, uh, maybe of his family afterwards and the suffering they went through, absolutely. But he himself, he got what he deserved, actually. So let's get into this. Trotsky and his family were now in St. Petersburg, which was in turmoil, and it was called Petrograd at the time because they wanted to make it sound less Germanic. Uh, the Tsar was gone and a provisional government was in place, and things were changing in Russia in a way not seen in over 300 years since the times of trouble. Trotsky and quickly Lenin were in the capital and their followers were awaiting what they had to say about the events that were unfolding. What Lenin was to say was shocking to his fellow Bolsheviks. He, was told, he told them they were not to back the government, but all power must be in the hands of the Soviets. When this was done, only then could the country be turned into a socialist one. This was a stark departure from his previous stand and aligned himself with Trotsky's position. With the Tsar gone, the political spectrum changed dramatically. The former left wing, the cadets, were now on the right, with the Mensheviks, Bolsheviks, and other socialists on the left. Lenin called for split from the Mensheviks, claiming that only his party could create the dictatorship of the proletariat. After some rankling, Trotsky was asked to be part of the executive committee of the Bolshevik party as a non-voting member. At the time, though, he belonged to a group known as the Interborough Organization, as many of its members had broken away from the other leftist groups. But they began to see that Lenin was moving in their direction, so many joined him. Trotsky, for his part, remained somewhat independent for the time being. But Lenin needed Trotsky, and vice versa. But as Rubinstein puts it in his biography of Leon, quote, by temperament, Lenin and Trotsky were almost complete opposites. Lenin was very one-minded, as all he cared about or even thought about was the revolution at hand. Politics was everything to him. When recalling listening to a piece by Beethoven known as the Appassionata, he thought, quote, must not listen to music too often. It makes me want to say kind, stupid things and pat the heads of people. As for Trotsky, there was more to life than that, as he was a real man about the world. He enjoyed music, literature, languages, hunting, and fishing. None of these things interested Lenin in the least. Even with all of these personality differences, it was apparent that they truly needed each other to pull off the revolution. Lenin needed Trotsky's oratorical skills to rile up the citizenry, which is just what he did. The city was in a state of electricity. People were wondering what would come of the change in the government, not seen since the days of the Vetch of Novgorod. Democratic governance with the rights of everyone guaranteed. While we know what the outcome is, no one at the time did. Lenin, though, was totally against this type of system and believed that a small group must run things, something that Trotsky was vehemently opposed to in the past, but hypocritically changed when he saw the opportunity to make a power grab. In June, at the first All-Russian Congress of the Soviets, Trotsky and Lenin called on the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries to abandon the provisional government and support a revolution. One of their main points objecting to the existing system and that government was their support of the war. Lenin knew that the only way the Bolsheviks could ever hope to be in power was through an armed revolution, as they would never have a majority of popular support. By inciting the troops and workers with the prospect of ending the war, 
he had hoped to bring them over to his way of thinking. In July, a crisis came about where dissatisfied workers, soldiers, and sailors descended on the Taride Palace where the government was working on trying to solve problems within Russia. They had grabbed one of the ministers, Viktor Chernov, and were ready to lynch him when out came Trotsky to save his life. The city, though, was in upheaval. Half a million people took to the streets, with looting going on and gangs from the right and left fighting. 400 people died in the battles. Who was going to bring order was the question of the day. Lenin and Trotsky were now wanted men. Lenin hid out, but Leon was out there in the opening, open, uh, just daring the government to arrest him. On July 23rd, they obliged and took him into custody and took away the guns from the Red Guard. At that point, Alexander Kerensky, leader of the provisional government, appointed General Lavra Kornilov to be commander-in-chief. This was the biggest mistake he could have made. On August 24th, Kornilov called for the overthrow of the government, and it looked like he wanted to install himself as a military dictator. This was to be known as the Kornilov Affair, and would help bring down the leadership. Kerensky called on help from the Bolsheviks, the Kronstadt sailors, who were in open revolt, and restored all the confiscated weapons to the Red Guards. By August 31st, Kornilov was arrested, and the left was now fully armed and dangerous. Kerensky's image was in shambles, and the Bolsheviks were at the pinnacle of their popularity. Trotsky was summarily released from jail on September 4th. He was now the president of the Petrograd Soviet, with Lenin still scared to show himself. Trotsky made a speech to them saying, quote, We are all party men, and more than once we shall clash with one another. But we shall conduct the work of the Petrograd Soviet in a, in a period, in a spirit of lawfulness and full freedom for all parties. The hand of the Presidium will never lend itself to the suppression of a minority. He lied. Another hypocrisy in the life of Leon Trotsky. The whole country was in turmoil, with Lenin calling on armed insurrection from his hiding place. Trotsky's brother-in-law, Lev Kamenev, and Grigory Zinoviev were unsure of things and were against open revolution yet. Trotsky also cautioned his comrades, but for a different reason. He wanted to wait until October 20th, when the second All-Russia Congress of Soviets was scheduled to meet. The Bolsheviks were likely to gain the majority of delegates, and from there, they could seize the government. The Kerensky government then made another fatal error. They were considering ordering half of the Petrograd garrison to the front of the war, where the Germans were beginning to get closer and closer to the capital. Lenin and Trotsky felt that this was a prelude to abandoning the city, moving the capital back to Moscow, and blunting the potential for an armed revolutionary takeover. With Lenin returning on October 10th, a vote of the Central Committee of the party was called to start an armed uprising. The vote was 10 to 2, with Kamenev and Zinoviev dissenting. They also at that time set up the first political bureau, or Politburo, with Lenin, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Stalin. On October 16th, the Petrograd garrison voted to refuse to be sent out of the capital. Trotsky then ordered the Red Guards to be armed with rifles, sending out thousands of them. Zinoviev and Kamenev resigned from the Central Committee in protest as they felt there was just no way they were going to win. The Mensheviks and Social Revolutionaries called for a delay to the upcoming meeting of the Soviet, with the intent to counter Lenin and Trotsky. This actually backfired as it gave those two more time to gather their forces under the umbrella of the Military Revolutionary Committee, the MRC. On the 25th, the MRC was beginning to put a stranglehold on the city with roadblocks and armed patrols. Lenin and Trotsky declared that they had taken power. The 26th was when the remaining ministers of the provisional government were arrested. As for Kerensky, he had already fled. The Bolsheviks then went to the Soviets with 300 delegates and an additional 80 other supporters to garner a majority in the 650-man Congress. There, Trotsky's old friend, Yuri Martov, called for a broad coalition of parties to rule the country. Leon then turned on him and pointed out that it was his party that overthrew the government. He went on to say, quote, 
our rising has been victorious. Now they tell us, renounce your victory, yield, make a compromise. With whom? With these miserable little groups that make these proposals? You are miserable, isolated individuals. You are bankrupt. You have played out your role. Go where you belong, to the dustbin of history. The Bolsheviks had established one-party rule, and thanks to a man who vehemently opposed to it just 12 years earlier, Trotsky betrayed his country and his people. It was also the spark that led to the horrific events that were to claim the lives of close to three million in armed conflict and many more civilians. Trotsky's hands are drenched in their blood. Lenin offered the title of head of government to Trotsky, but he refused. He felt that being a Jew would be detrimental to the success, the success of the revolution. He knew that there was a deep anti-Semitic attitude throughout Russia, especially amongst the peasant population. Instead, he was made commissar for foreign affairs. Then the real fighting began. Ten days of heavy fighting ensued before Moscow came under Bolshevik control. Large bands of anti-Bolsheviks were attacking St. Petersburg, but they were repulsed. On October 27th, the Bolsheviks imposed censorship to increase their control. Then Trotsky pulled an analogy to the French Revolution, which sent shivers down the spines of the more moderate Bolsheviks. Quote, You wax indignant at the naked terror which we are applying against our class enemies. But let me tell you that in one month's time, at most, it will assume more frightful forms, modeled on the terror of the great French revolutionaries. Not the fortress, but the guillotine will await our enemies. Within the month, the dreaded secret police, the Cheka, was formed. The terror began. Trotsky now reached out to the Germans to end the war and sign a peace treaty. He needed the troops to come back home to face a growing threat from former Tsarist supporters and other enemies of the Bolsheviks. Trotsky proposed to the Germans that they would just stop all hostilities, but we're just not going to give in to the demands to cede all that territory to them. The Germans called his bluff and advanced their troops toward the Russian border. Trotsky and Lenin blinked and agreed with the horrible terms of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, but they never signed the treaty itself. This was done by a lower-ranking diplomat. They knew the price was steep, but the threats to their regime were great and growing by the minute. The White Army was forming under a loose confederation in the Ukraine, in Ukraine and Siberia. Ukrainians, Georgians, and Cossacks, who for centuries yearned to be freed from the Russian yoke, began to rattle their swords. And here's an interesting little story. Here's where a powerful Czech army in 1918 made its way from the Volga region, where they were allies of the Russians, and they headed towards Vladivostok and the port there to make their way to the Western Front to fight against the Germans. They helped the anti-Bolsheviks at times secure the Trans-Siberian Railway. I want to thank uh, listener Ladislav for that tip on that issue on our Facebook page. Uh, maybe it's going to become a full podcast one day. With all the unrest in Russia, Trotsky was made Commissar of War, which saved the revolution. But the price that the country would pay was steep. He transformed the Red Guard into a highly organized Red Army. Trotsky recruited former Tsarist officials, which would make up about three-quarters of the commanders. But in order to control them, he set up a system of dual commandership with a Bolshevik commissar to watch over the officers. Trotsky then began a conscription of peasants to swell the army to over three million strong. In order to keep discipline, he used an old Roman method, decimation. Any unit not willing to fight had every tenth man killed. Deserters? Shot without question. Officers suspected of not fulfilling their duties? Tried and shot. His train, which was heavily fortified, covered over 125,000 miles during the Civil War, with Trotsky going from front to front to assess the situation. He was absolutely tireless in his actions in the war. By 1919, the situation in Petrograd and Moscow was dire. Lenin was frightened enough to consider moving the capital, but in came Trotsky to the rescue. He personally led his men on horseback to throw back the White Army. He
he bathed in the glory of his actions in winning the Civil War, which, which you might figure, annoyed a lot of his fellow leaders. By the spring of 1921, the war was over, but not the problems. Famine and strikes plagued the winners. Trotsky believed himself to be universally beloved, so he could take care of things, but it was simply not so. He and the whole of the Bolshevik regime were despised by the general population. With a shattered economy and a secret police more cruel and vicious than the Tsar's Okhrana, they were looked at with the same contempt as their predecessors. People must have wondered what the difference was. Trotsky then was appointed as the Commissar of Transportation, where he used similar methods to get work done as he did during the Civil War. But then he had to handle another major challenge. The Kronstadt sailors were now, once again, in open revolt. In their proclamation, they wrote, The power of the monarchy, with its police and its gendarmes, has passed into the hands of the communist usurpers, who have given the people not freedom, but the constant fear of torture by the Cheka. To the protests of the peasants expressed in spontaneous uprisings, and those of the workers whose living conditions have compelled them to strike, they have answered with mass executions and a bloodletting that exceeds even the Tsarist generals. Leon was sent in to lead the counterattack, but the first one failed as they tried to cross the frozen Gulf of Finland. As the men in the fortress used artillery to punch holes in the ice and send the Red Army into the water to drown. But on March 16th, they attacked again, this time successfully. 2,000 men were executed and thousands more suffered at the new concentration camp on an island in the White Sea. The suppression of the Kronstadt Rebellion was one of the things that really haunted Trotsky for the rest of his life. He must have known how hypocritical he was, but it never seemed to matter. Even in his book, My Life, he only mentions it on one line. Everyone knew now that the Bolsheviks were no different than the Tsarist regime. Well, maybe a little different. They were crueler. Next up as targets were the intellectuals. Poets and writers who were writing about personal freedoms and the like were targets. Trotsky, an intellectual himself, had no problem rounding these people up. Thankfully, many caught up in this net were not executed, but expelled from the country. Those who stayed behind, though, were to be caught up in Stalin's net in the 1930s. They wished they had left when this group did. Trotsky wrote, Those elements whom we are sending or will send abroad are politically worthless in themselves, but they are potential weapons in the hands of our possible enemies. In the event of new military complications, all these unreconciled and incorrigible elements will turn into military political elements of the enemy, and we will be forced to shoot them. He was now intellectualizing his own hypocrisy. In the background, Stalin and his supporters began to dredge up past writings of Trotsky, criticizing Lenin. At that time, it was not generally circulated, but these articles and letters were well known within the party. The noose that would go around his neck was being deftly created. When Lenin suffered his first stroke in May 1922, Trotsky was not told about it for three days. He realized that this was done purposely, as he wrote years later. This could have been no accident. Those who were for a long time had been preparing to become my opponents, Stalin above all, were anxious to gain time. Stalin was now in a very powerful position as he controlled access to the ailing leader. Lenin was becoming more and more aware of the power that Stalin was gathering. It is here that we see how naive Leon was. Instead of building a power base himself, he allowed his nemesis to gain more and more influence every day, without so much as a peep. Lenin, sensing real problems ahead, urged Trotsky to challenge Stalin at the Twelfth Party Congress, but he wouldn't do it. This is what sealed his fate. Then he finally gained a backbone in late 1923 when he tried to challenge Kamenev, Zinoviev, and Stalin. His group called themselves the Left Opposition. Stalin now had a target to focus on. The Left Opposition wanted to reintroduce debate within the Central Committee and the party in general. Trotsky wrote about his ideas of reorganizing the government in Pravda. It was to prove not only too little too late, but a proof that he was against the government, 
which would lead to his exile. On January 21, 1924, Lenin died. The last protection Trotsky had was gone. With Leon out of town, Stalin rushed the funeral so it would be near impossible for Trotsky to attend. The other problem was that Leon was in bed with a fever. Both timing and luck were not on his side. The noose was complete. Now to put it around his adversary's neck. Kamenev and Zinoviev aligned themselves with Stalin against Trotsky. They hated him and wanted to take him down. Little did they know that they would eventually be taken down themselves by Stalin. But the matter at hand was they needed to take down their immediate adversary. Now, remember those anti-Lenin letters uh, that Trotsky wrote that I mentioned in the last podcast? Well, now they were becoming heavily circulated to the general population. But that wasn't the real death blow to his career in the Soviet Union. It was by his own hand with the publishment of the paper The Lessons of October. In it, he criticized Kamenev and Zinoviev for their lack of guts during the revolution and how Trotsky was the main associate of Lenin's. You know, tooting your own horn is a sure way to alienate all those around you. Stalin, for the most part now, played it carefully, but made it known that no one argued with Lenin more, disagreed with him more, insulted him more, or betrayed him more than Trotsky. Stalin now put the noose on his neck. It was over. Trotsky was forced to resign his post as war minister in January 1925. And something happened that really surprised Leon, and that was another surge of anti-Semitic sentiment making its way through the Bolshevik party. He was totally astonished by it, which shows how completely naive he was. Trotsky didn't realize that there was still a strong element of anti-Semitism throughout Russia, even within the supposedly more tolerant Soviets. During this time, Trotsky would be sick quite often, which is really not surprising given the enormous amount of pressure he was under. This further isolated him from those in power. But while he was away, Stalin was dispatching his two former adversaries, Kamenev and Zinoviev. They became the joint opposition, something that Stalin was hoping for. Now he could get rid of all three, because then they joined with Trotsky and were fighting Stalin, who they saw as the real threat. Bukharin became Stalin's chief ally and helped him oust from the Politburo of the three. Trotsky railed at his enemy and accused him of being the grave digger of the revolution. And this was done at a meeting of the Central Committee. And this caused Stalin to get up and leave. Yuri Piatakov warned Trotsky that, quote, Stalin will never forgive you until the third and the fourth generation. How right he was. On January 17, 1928, Trotsky and his family were forcibly exiled to Alma-Ata, the capital of Kazakhstan. He was to spend a year there writing letters to his friends, who were now being rounded up and sent to prisons in Siberia. He also began to write his memoirs, with Stalin even letting him take his entire archives of books with him. His children, the two girls who he left behind, Olga and Nina, were being harassed and lost their jobs. Olga had to divorce Kamenev and was getting sicker by the day. Later that year, Nina died of tuberculosis. She would not be the first of his children to die before him. An order was sent down on January 20th, 1929, that Trotsky was to be expelled from Russia. He was informed that he and his family, including his two sons, would be headed to Constantinople. At first, he stayed at the Soviet consulate there, where he was treated with respect, but that didn't last very long. Trotsky was forced to find a hotel, and with him wanting to move to Western Europe, began to ask for asylum. The Netherlands said no. Then the French reminded him that, you know, that order of expulsion in 1916, that's still in effect. The Germans wouldn't take him as the communists there, who were backed by Stalin, threatened to kill him. And the Nazis, well, you know the story. Norway was a no because they just couldn't guarantee his safety. Same with Italy, no go. Well, he hoped above all that England would surely let him in, but they didn't want the controversy. Remember, they wouldn't allow a relative of the uh, king and the granddaughter of Victoria, uh, Queen Victoria, in just a few years ago, Nicholas II and his family, all because of not wanting controversy. They moved into a home on the island of 
Prinkipo, about an hour and a half by boat from Constantinople. He stayed in Turkey for about four and a half relatively productive and calm years. In order to survive financially, he made a deal to sell his memoirs. He started a journal called The Bulletin with his son Lev, and while it didn't have much of a readership, only about a thousand, it had one very influential reader, Joseph Stalin. Trotsky believed in his typical naive manner that writing things critical about his arch nemesis would somehow weaken him and lead to his downfall. What he failed to realize, the more he made himself in a pain in the neck to the head of the Soviet Union, the bigger the target was on his back. Trotsky began to hear the horror stories from back home on the collectivization programs and the enormous human suffering that was going on. Although in one of his writings, he refused to believe that it was all because of Stalin's heavy hand. Quote, At the present time, hardly anybody would be foolish enough to repeat the twaddle of liberals to the effect that collectivization as a whole was accomplished by naked force. Yet everything pointed to it. Trotsky could not accept the fact that he was as much responsible for what was going on as Stalin. He helped create the state that was killing torturing and starving to death millions of people. During this initial phase of foreign isolation, he wrote two important works, My Life and History of the Russian Revolution, both of which were made widely available. But when you get really into his works, you see his distortions and lies, as well as his vain, glorious view of himself. Trotsky talks about the day after the provisional government was overthrown that huge swaths of the population in Petrograd were in the streets celebrating. Eh, problem was, that didn't happen. In fact, few people even knew what was going on. One last book was now being started, one that would never be completed, a biography of Joseph Stalin. Now, he was allowed to travel a little, a little, little just one trip you know, to Denmark to speak to a large audience. But there he found out that his daughter, Zanadia, was suffering de from depression and likely schizophrenia. She committed suicide by turning on the gas in her kitchen. Trotsky again took no responsibility, blaming Stalin for his death. Her death. His first wife would not follow. She blamed him for their death and wrote to him that it is likely that his grandchildren wouldn't be long for this world as well. Lev Trotsky was by now in Germany. But he had to get out because Adolf Hitler had just been made chancellor. Once again, filled with self-worth, Leon wrote to the Politburo, begging it to be prepared against Hitler, and that Stalin was setting them up for a disaster. Obviously, no one paid any attention, except you-know-who. In 1933, he headed to France, but was under strict rules, so he stayed very low-key, which allowed the government to ease some of their restrictions. The problem was, once the press found out he was in their town, they descended on him, forcing him out. Trotsky was very aware of what happened to enemies of Stalin in Europe. They were either kidnapped and returned to the Soviet Union, or wound up dead. He ended up near Grenoble for a year, at the home of a school teacher, but was asked not to write and stay very, very low. It was a depressing time for him. It was to be really much harder on his on his wife and him, as in March 1935, he heard that his son Sergei had been arrested in Moscow. Leon knew he was as good as dead, which came about within the year. French communists and right-wingers both wanted Trotsky out of the country. He headed to Norway, where he was greeted with suspicion and concern. When he was expelled yet again, he warned Trig V. Lee, who would later become the head of the United Nations, that Hitler would expel him one day. On the day that the Germans invaded Norway, King Hakon looked at Lee and reminded him of Trotsky's curse. Leon, though, had good friends and artists Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, who used their influence to convince Mexican President Lazaro Cardenas to allow Trotsky and his wife to settle in Mexico. Arriving on an oil tanker on January 9, 1937, Kahlo was there to greet them. They were to stay at the home of his benefactors for the next two years. Trotsky and Kahlo were to have a brief affair, much to the chagrin of Rivera and Sadova, Leon's wife. The time in Mexico was rejuvenating for Trotsky, but he was still the center of controversy. In the Soviet Union, the show trials were going on, 
with most of them focusing on Leon as an enemy of the state, colluding with those on trial. Trotsky tried to refute all the allegations, pointing out the obvious lies. But then Western media as a whole denounced him, believing Stalin's point of view. And this is what really kind of surprised me. The ones who bought into the Soviet propaganda the most were surprisingly the far right in the United States, especially in the magazine The New Republic. In 1938, his son Lev had surgery for acute appendicitis in Paris, but did not survive the surgery. Trotsky believed that agents for Stalin had poisoned him, but that seems not to be the case. In 1994, an agent responsible for assassinations for Stalin claimed that they had no hand in his death. In fact, according to Robert Service in his biography of Leon, that Lev was worth more alive than dead as his correspondence with his father gave the NKVD lots of information on their nemesis. Whatever the case, Trotsky had now lost all four of his children. Feeling increasingly under fire, Trotsky, his wife Natalia, left the home of Kahlo and Rivera, both of whom by now had renounced Leon. They moved to a house in Avenida Vienna, which as service puts it was a cross between a villa and a fortress. But as much of a supposed safe place this looked like, Trotsky was rather flippant with the security as he would meet with total strangers and unknowingly allowed NKVD agents to befriend him. One was Robert Sheldon Hart. Hart's mission was to team up with David Alfaro Sequerios and help him and his squad assassinate Trotsky. Around dawn on May 24, 1940, about 20 men surrounded Leon's villa. They opened fire for minutes, firing about 300 shots. Trotsky and his wife dove under the bed and survived the attack. Natalia rushed to her grandson's room, finding him safe but wounded in the ankle by one of the bullets. Initially, Hart was thought to have been abducted by the assassination squad, but his dead body was found a few months later, and it was determined that he was the one who let the killers inside the compound. Sequeros was to leave Mexico for Chile for a few years, but returned as a national treasure due to his artistic abilities. What no one knew until the 1990s was that there were three groups in Mexico assigned with killing Trotsky. In the book, The Sword and the Shield, The Mitrokin Archive, and The Secret History of the KGB by Christopher Andrew and Vasily Mitrokin, the first group was headed by Cardidad Mercader del Rio and her son Ramon. The second was headed by Sequeros, whose codename was Kone, K-O-N-E, and the third was Joseph Romyadladovich Grigulovich, who was a leader in liquidating Trotskyists during the Spanish Civil War. Because Sequeros' group failed, Ramon Mercader was the new prime assassin. Carefully, he ingratiated himself within Trotsky's aides, visiting ten times, giving Leon's grandson a gift and having Trotsky review an article he had written. For three months he kept the ruse up, until he met with his target in his office alone on August 20th, 1940, where he took out an ice pick out of his pocket and buried it into the back of Trotsky's skull. Leon let out a shriek, causing his guards and his wife to rush to the room, where they found Trotsky had wrestled the ice pick from Mercader and stood over him. Losing blood rapidly, he was rushed to the hospital, where he died the next day. His last words to his wife were, Please, say to our friends that I am sure of the victory of the Fourth International. Go forward. Interestingly enough, when Trotsky was stabbed, he was working on a manuscript of the biography of Stalin. He lost so much blood on it, he so stained the work that much of it was destroyed because of the amount of blood that soaked its pages. Stalin got his revenge in spades. McCarter was arrested and sentenced to 20 years in prison, but his prison time was more like house arrest as he lived in pretty luxurious accommodations. After his sentence was served, he went to Cuba and then Moscow, where he was given numerous awards for his service to the Soviet Union by Leonid Brezhnev. You know, when I started this podcast series, I had just received my monthly issue of Discover Magazine, and who should I find inside but Trotsky's great-granddaughter, Nora Volkov, who was the head of the National Institute of Drug Abuse in the United States. At least his descendants are doing noble work.
Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join me next time as we return to something positive, the culture of Russia, with the telling of the life of the literary giant, Leo Tolstoy. Don't forget to drop by the blog site where you can, if you'd like to, make a donation, big or small, to help keep the podcast going. Also, join us on Facebook, and you can hear about Vladislav's um, material on the Czech army in 1918. And there, you can ask a question, leave a message, or make a suggestion. So as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.